So as you know, I have uh, done two previous uh, uh, sermons when I'm up here, when I was up here on Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, Daniel chapter 2. We are continuing now into Daniel chapter 3. And the last time when we talked about uh, Daniel chapter 2, you know how that uh, chapter ended with the, uh, the, well, the chapter was about the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of this great uh, statue that had uh, different levels of uh, metals, made out of different levels of metals, and the stone that was, uh, that uh, hit, that struck the base of the, of the statue and destroyed it. Uh, the stone of a material that uh, no man uh, knew of. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar was very troubled by that dream, and he needed that dream interpreted, and eventually Daniel interpreted that dream for Nebuchadnezzar. So now we start chapter 3 with Nebuchadnezzar's response to that interpretation. And how did he respond? Um, obviously, I think it's quite clear that he did not heed the advice of uh, Daniel or the implicit advice of Daniel because Nebuchadnezzar indeed went ahead to build a statue and he built it essentially after, after himself. And after he built that statue, um, he assembled the people before it and he demanded that the people would, would have to bow down before it when the, when the particular hour of the day was indicated through, through music. I think what probably happened was Nebuchadnezzar was indeed troubled by Daniel's interpretation of the dream. Which, which essentially signaled that the kingdom of Babylon, the rule of Nebuchadnezzar, will come to an end. Right? And any, you, I mean, you sort of put yourself in Nebuchadnezzar's po uh, position. If you are the, the leader of, a, say, if you're a leader of an organization and you're told that your organization is going to go bankrupt uh, one day soon, you will, you will probably be a bit uh, anxious, a bit kanjong, right? Uh, and you'll be quite concerned, uh, as I, I believe Nebuchadnezzar was. And this whole idea of actually building that, that, uh, that statue and requiring everyone to bow down before it um, is actually, to me, a very understandable response. You know, when, when, a, when a nation is in crisis, one of the best things, or one of the, 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 the foolproof responses we have seen in history is to what they call rally around the flag, right? You, 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 you get people to feel, uh, to feel nationalistic, to commit to the country, right? And I think that this was Nebuchadnezzar's way of reinforcing the commitment of the people to his rule, to his kingdom, to the kingdom of uh, Babylon, right? And he was enforcing this commitment in, in terms of the most crude form of idolatry. Yeah? Build a, build, a, build a statue, a god, an idol, basically, and everyone has to bow down uh, and worship it. But of course, we know through the reading of Scripture, of the, of the chapter, that not everyone bowed. Three in particular, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three friends of uh, Daniel, they did not bow, right? They were confronted by Nebuchadnezzar. Um, they still didn't bow. Um, and of course, because of their insubordination, they were thrown into the furnace. Oh, by the way, my apologies. The, the sermon outlined the introduction, the sub-point contrast and choices. That one was a mistaken cut and paste from my last sermon. So please ignore that. Yeah? Um, but, okay, so, so what... What does this uh, chapter hold uh, for us in terms of uh, uh, God's word to us? Let's look at uh, the, my first point, which is really to, to understand what is at stake in this entire, entire episode. And I think when we think about what is at stake for, not just for Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, but really for us as, as Christians, as we try to draw lessons from this, um, 
The first thing really is what I call the risk of drawing the wrong conclusions from this, from this chapter. So in a sense, I'm starting the sermon by take, reflecting on the conclusions to draw from it. What do I mean by the risk of drawing the wrong conclusions? Now, um, we, I think most, if not all of you, are familiar with, with, the, with the book of Daniel. Um, the, the first, basically, the first half, the first six chapters of Daniel is uh, really we see how God preserves his people, right? And uh, we, we looked at that in the previous sermons already, how, how uh, God preserved Daniel on uh, well, a, a vegetarian diet. You remember that one, Daniel 1 and then subsequently giving Daniel the gift of uh, being able to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. We see the, the, the encounter with the fiery furnace. Later on, we will see the Daniel in the lion's den, etc. And uh, so, so this, today's sermon uh, is an, yet another account of these events where God intervenes to save his people. Yeah. And... We know that throughout history, throughout scripture, throughout the history of the church, that this has happened time and time again. You know, and we thank and praise God for that, for intervening to preserve his people. But at the same time, I think when we look at this chapter, we want to be careful about how we approach redemptive history, how we understand redemptive history. Foremost, I think we want to be careful not to take the view that God exists to serve men. Okay? We want to be careful not to take the view that God exists to serve men. Why do I say that? I think that there is a risk among some Christians to look at this, this, uh, this story, you know, and to conclude that, you know, God God exists to save us every time we are going to be thrown into a, a, a fiery furnace, uh, so to speak. And I fear that many contemporary Christians, they draw the wrong conclusions from this, from this episode, precisely because of that. Uh, we even hear preachers preach from the pulpit, you know, Believe in Jesus and you will be prosperous. Your marriage will be fulfilling. Your children will be healthy, smart, do well in school. Nothing bad will ever come out your way, right? Because you are a child of God and God will bail you out. God will bail you out every time you are in trouble. This is the same kind of faith uh, that Satan accused Job of having, right? You remember verse uh, Job? Uh, Job chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Has not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee in thy face. Right, remember that verse, those few verses? Um, it, it reminds me of a book. I was thinking about this and it reminds me of a book that I came across some years ago. The title of the book is The, the Prayer of uh, Jabez. Jabez is a, a, a minor uh, character, but important character uh, in, in, uh, uh, who comes up in Chronicles, First Chronicles. Um, this book was written by a person, uh, a, preach, uh, a, a preacher by the name of Bruce Wilkinson, very popular preacher. Let me read to you the blurb of the book. You know, the blurb is the, you know, that, that summary, that sort of the hook that, that's supposed to entice you to read the entire book. Right? Okay, so this is the blurb. It's a timeless prayer that produces timely results. Bruce Wilkinson takes readers to 1 Chronicles 4.10 to discover how they can release God's miraculous power and experience the blessings God longs to give each of us. The life of Jabez one of the Bible's most overlooked heroes of the faith, burst from unbroken pages of genealogies in an audacious four-part prayer that brings him an extraordinary measure of divine favor, anointing, and protection. 
readers who commit to offering the same prayer on a regular basis will find themselves extravagantly blessed by God and agents of His miraculous power in everyday life. Do you want to be extravagantly blessed by God? Are you ready to reach for the extraordinary? To ask God for the abundant blessings He longs to give you? Join Bruce Wilkinson to discover how the remarkable prayer of a little-known Bible hero can release God's power, favour and protection. You'll see how one daily prayer can help you leave the past behind and break through to the life you were meant to live. Huh. Brothers and sisters, a faith that rests on such belief, I think, is tenuous, if not uh, dangerous. Why do I say that? You see, as long as we live in a fallen world, in a sin-filled, imperfect world, bad things are going to happen to us. Yeah, Just look around you. Bad things happen. But when we, when we hold such a belief, when bad things happen, this logic leads us to two conclusions. Number one, right? if bad things happen, number one, we don't actually have this faith since we are not prospering but suffering. Right? So for them, a manifestation and expression of God's favour is not the gifts of the Spirit but prosperity. So by definition, if you do not have prosperity, you're not enjoying prosperity, you do not have the faith. That's problem number one. Problem number two, that this faith is actually not worth having, right? If, if I'm to sign up to this belief because of the promise of prosperity, and then I don't prosper, then why would I want to uh, sign up for this belief? It's a, false, it's a false faith, right? You told me that I'm going to prosper, but I'm not prospering, Okay? But we know that this is not what Scripture teaches us, right? We know this is not Christ's example. We know this is not the gospel. And we shall. Let, and I will. I will. I will elaborate on this uh, shortly. Okay. So, so this is a risk of one risk of how some Christians might interpret this particular episode uh, in the Bible, right? That it's God's job to pull us out of the fiery furnace. Now let me move to the second, uh, second interpretation. Yep. And I, the subhead for that is, but if not. Yeah. Three simple words, but three profound words in the context of what we just read. You see, the interpretation of this episode uh, that the interpretation of this episode based on what I mentioned earlier was about how God is supposed to or God, God is expected to save God is expected to save us right but there is another way to look at this now let's look at the other way in verse 12 what does verse 12 say uh, verse 12 basically tells us that uh, Shadrach Meshach and Abednego didn't bow right um, and the king, Nebuchadnezzar, knows that they didn't, they didn't bow because basically the, the Chaldeans, the, the, the snitchers, the, the, they, they told Nebuchadnezzar that, boss, these three people didn't follow your command. Okay? Verse 16 to 18, the three men told Nebuchadnezzar to his face. Respectfully, they told him respectfully, but they told him to his face, that they were not going to bow regardless of what he did to them and regardless of whether God would save them or not. Verse 16 to 18 again. Huh? O men of Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this manner. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. Right? God is able to deliver us and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego know 
that their God is more than able to save them from the burning furnace if He wanted to. But they don't actually know if God will save them or if it is, or if it is in God's will that they be saved. They don't know. Okay? They don't know. So I invite you to put yourselves in their shoes or in their sandals for a moment. Okay? So bear with me. So imagine you are a senior government official in the government of Nebuchadnezzar, as they are, the three of them. You know, they actually found favour together with Daniel. Uh, they found favour in Nebuchadnezzar's sight and they were fast-tracked, promoted. Now, so you are a senior official. So you go to work one day and then you got a, a memo or an email saying, all of you, the entire uh, civil service, you have to go to uh, the plains of Dura tomorrow, uh, city hall, Padang, whatever. Uh, you have to go to the plains of Dura tomorrow. You have to be prepared to bow down before this statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? That's the instruction and no exceptions. You as a believer, you will be a bit concerned. You go home, you tell your wife, you tell your children, I got this memo. I'm expected, as is everyone else, to go to the plains of Dura tomorrow and we have to bow down and worship the statue. And your wife will ask you, what are you going to do? You say, I'm not going to bow down. You're not going to bow down? Okay, but if you don't bow down, what's going to happen to you? What's, go what's going to happen to us, our family, our children? Okay? And then after dinner, your friends come and visit you. And they say, hey, did you receive that memo? I heard that there was this memo going around. Everyone expected to go there and uh, go to Dura and bow down before this statue. They say, yeah, I got the memo. So are you going to do it? No, I'm not going to do it. You're not going to do it. Why? You know, you, they, they're going to kill you if you don't do it. No? no, I'm not going to do it. Your friends say that, actually, it's okay to do it. I mean, it's just a statue, right? You're not, you, you, you know, you're just going through the motions. You, you, don't, have to, you don't have to commit your heart to, to this God or to Nebuchadnezzar. You know, just, you know, check off that box. Anyway, there will be thousands of people there. No one will know that you, no one will know that you bow. You know, we know that you worship the one true God. Yeah, we know that and you know that and God knows that. So it's fine. A little bit of compromise, God will understand. In fact, look at it this way, right? If you don't bow, you are going to be killed, very likely. No, in fact, you will be killed. That's the instruction, right? So what good are you for God's kingdom? What good are you for God's word if you're dead? God's work if you're dead, right? You bow, God understands, you live, you continue to serve Him. No, I will not bow. Okay? That is the position that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego is in. And I think it's important for us to, to keep that in mind. You know, this, don't, don't let this these verses be an abstraction to you, you know, that, uh, you know, Sherev, Meshach, Abednego, they're supposed to bow, they didn't bow, okay, that's, they struggled, I'm very sure that they struggled, as all of us would, under such circumstances, as humans, we will struggle with the pressures to compromise, we will struggle, and the next day, when they end up at the plains of Dura, and they don't bow, and they had this confrontation, with uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, I'll get to that in more detail in a bit. But they had this confrontation with Nebuchadnezzar and it was decided by the king that, okay, you don't want to bow, throw you into the furnace, right? They were faithful all the way to the end, even knowing, at least at that point, when they were about to be thrown into the furnace, that God is not going to God may, not, may, may well not pull them out of that fire. But if not, I'm still not going to bow. So they really didn't know what was going to happen to them physically. The only thing they knew was that they were going to be thrown into the fiery furnace 
And being thrown into the fiery furnace is not a stroll in the park. Yeah? It's not a stroll in the park. And they actually saw the, you know, they saw the furnace being heated seven times hotter. And even the, the, the big burly uh, special forces uh, soldiers, right, uh, the mighty men of Nebuchadnezzar, they were burned, uh, they were killed uh, in the process of, of uh, throwing them uh, in. They, they didn't know what God was going to do. This was a trial of faith for them. So brothers and sisters in Christ, I put to you that what matters here is their response to the trial and not the outcome of the trial. Okay, The response to the trial and not the outcome of the trial. And this is where we see true faith at work. Faith in the face of uncertainty. We see a faith that doesn't pretend to know all of God's ways. Yeah? A faith that doesn't pretend that nothing bad, physically harm, nothing bad will happen to God's children. A faith that gives Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego the courage to say that come what may, we are going to serve the Lord. That is what we see on display. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego don't know God's ways in the sense that they don't know the outcome. They don't know the outcome. So they are not walking into the furnace uh, like, like Cristiano Ronaldo is walking to the penalty spot. Sure, score one. Right, no, no problem. I know that I will score. That is not the case here, right? They had no idea. All they knew at that time was that they were going to be thrown into a very hot fire that had already, been, that had already killed uh, some people. Yet they remained completely faithful to God. So what do we see here? We see here that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were indeed confident. They were indeed confident, but not in themselves. They were not confident in, them. they were not confident in and of themselves. They were, they were confident that come what may, God knows best. And that is enough for them to put their trust in Him. They say to Nebuchadnezzar, even if God doesn't save us, we want you to know, O King, that we will not bow to your God. We will not worship that image. Now this is the kind of faith that we must aspire to. The three young men don't know what God is going to do. They don't know if their bodies are going to be burnt in the flames. Yet they continue to have the faith to serve and worship the one true God. So what can we tell from this? A number of things. Yeah? It is obvious that Daniel's three friends know God and have a living relationship with Him. Because of this, they dare to stand up for God even when every knee and head was bowing down to an idol. Because of this, they believe that their almighty God was more than able to save them from the flames even if He does not. He's more than able to do it. Even if He doesn't do it, He is more than able to do it. Because of this, they put their confidence not in Nebuchadnezzar. They put their confidence not even in themselves. You know, they are senior officials. Maybe they could have pulled some strings or something. Not even in themselves. They put their confidence uh, in God. Because of this, they sought first the kingdom and its righteousness. It reminds me of, uh, of, of a, a quote that I, I came across from uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones. I sometimes think, that the very essence of the whole Christian position and the secret of a successful spiritual life is just to realize two things. I must have complete, absolute confidence in God and no confidence in myself. That, brothers and sisters, is the lesson for us all. So, what happened in the fire? What was the result of this? Uh, we know from the, the readings how events unfolded. The three of them were thrown into the fire, but an astonished Nebuchadnezzar, of course, discovered a number of things. One, he discovered that it's not so easy to get rid 
of God's people. Um, and number two, he discovered something miraculous happening within that furnace. He said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like a son of God. What a miracle it was. Fire was hot enough to kill the soldiers who threw the three friends into it, but it did not touch Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their bodies not harmed. Their hair was not singed. Their robes were not scorched. Don't even have the smell of fire, right? Later on we read. Didn't even have the smell of fire on them. This is total deliverance. Total deliverance uh, is as if they never even went into the fire in the first place. So I want us to draw the right conclusions. You know, earlier I talked about uh, the, the, the risk of uh, wrong conclusions. We need to draw the right conclusions from our reflections on this episode. So what can we learn from this episode? Number one, God saves in accordance to His will and not our will. And in His time and not our time. Yeah? Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are saved from the flames, but we should not jump to the conclusion that no harm will ever befall us or that God will spare us from all hardships in this life. Brothers and sisters, God does permit terrible things to happen in the lives of, of His children. Yeah? Death of a child, a terminal illness, bankruptcy, broken families, natural disasters, babies born with disabilities, epidemics. These things happen, and they happen in accordance to God's will. In fact, the Bible tells us that we must prepare ourselves for the very opposite of a safe and secure existence. So as we face the bad that God permits in our lives, as we face hardships and trials, we are being challenged to have the kind of faith that Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, demonstrate here. A faith that the book of Hebrews says quench the violence of fire. Yeah, remember that? We have to have a faith that continues to follow God's ways, to do what is right, even if it costs our lives. That's the first lesson. Second lesson, God uses evil for good. It's very striking. You read verse 21. The three of them are bound. Yeah, they are bound and thrown into the furnace. Verse 24, Nebuchadnezzar sees the three men were loose and walking around in the midst of, fire, of, the, of the fire. Right? I mean, we, we don't... Uh, you know, I suppose visually you try to, try to picture the furnace. is obviously big enough for not only that number of people, but for them to actually be, be moving around. Yeah. So they were bound when they were thrown in. They were loose and walking around. Um... Three verses later, verse, 20, verse 27, when the three came out of the fire, they were examined by those who were present. Right? They were thoroughly examined. And what happened? Nothing. Right? Hair not singed, clothes not burned, didn't even smell like fire. Uh, I mean, didn't even smell burnt. Interestingly, the fire burned only one thing in that entire episode in the furnace, right? The fire burned only one thing. What is that one thing? The rope that was binding them, hand and feet. That was the only thing that was burned off, right? Remember, when they were thrown into the fire, they were bound. But when they were in the fire, they were loose and moving around. So they were freed. How significant, how symbolic. You see, the fire destroyed what needed to be destroyed, which is the bondage, right? Bondage of sin, bondage of the world, bondage of the ways of the world. So we see here how persecution strengthens the faith of God's people, 
right? Trials and persecutions have a very definitive role in spiritual life, okay? Have a very definitive, important, crucial role in the spiritual life of a true believer. Lesson number three. God can deliver us from a trial just as He did with these three men eventually, yeah? But sometimes God's will is not to deliver us from a trial, but to give us strength to endure in a trial, in the furnace. They were thrown in the furnace. They did end up in the furnace, right? And God preserved them in the furnace. And this truth, I think, has been manifested across the ages, yeah, in the persecution of uh, saints, many of whom uh, did not survive their persecution, were not uh, pulled out of the fire, so to speak. Even in your own lives, even in my life, your life, when you have prayed and fasted for deliverance from some, some pain, some suffering, but you do not, the deliverance is one thing, you do not have that deliverance. And that happens, right? That happens. So if a believer prays fervently for healing, and healing is not forthcoming, do we tell them that their faith is too weak? That they are actually not a believer? That Jesus is not with them? No, of course not. In fact, consider what Christ himself prayed for his beloved disciples in his high priestly prayer. Let me read uh, verse 14 and 15 of John 17. I have given them thy world, and thy world, I have given them thy world, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. Now, Jesus could easily have taken them away from the pain, suffering, trials of the world. He could easily have done that, but he, he didn't, right? He prayed for protection for them in the world against evil. So where does this whole story point us? What is the basic, what is the, what is the, what is the basis to these, these uh, uh, three lessons that I just talked about? I think the answer quite simply and quite profoundly is Christ, right? And we see this when we think about um, uh, deliverance, and we think about uh, what happened in the furnace. So let me move uh, to that section. Nebuchadnezzar noticed something astonishing in the furnace. Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire. They have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is the Son of God. It's like the Son of God. So why is it that the three friends are not burned up in the fiery furnace? Who is this fourth man walking with them in the fire? The answers to these questions are related because I think it is immediately obvious that it is the presence of the fourth man which keeps the three friends from being consumed by the flames. This is not a coincidence. A fourth man, uh, you know, it's not by coincidence that the fourth man uh, appeared. Uh, logic will not allow it, right? There is an obvious correlation here, but more than that, this is causation. It is causation because of the outcome, yep, that the three men were not burned. So who is this fourth man? Nebuchadnezzar refers to the fourth man as the son of God. We must remember, we must remember that Nebuchadnezzar is not a believer. Yeah? He's not a believer. He has no scriptural basis himself. He has no scriptural basis, no scriptural reference point through which to understand who this fourth man is. Remember when he confronted the three uh, uh, who, uh, who uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when he confronted them and he challenged them, which God will deliver you out of my hands? Clearly, even though Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged Daniel's God in chapter 2, as far as he is concerned, the reality is that the only God that he worships 
is himself. Okay, so he has no basis as far as as understanding what uh, who the fourth man is, which whom he calls the Son of God. So how is it that Nebuchadnezzar could have this revelation? Well, I think it's quite simple. It was God who led him to to these very words that he used to explain what was unfolding before his eyes. So what is the identity and role of the fourth man? What is the identity and role of the fourth man? Um, I'll say three things about that. First is, most reformed commentators are of the view that the fourth man is the, the, the pre-incarnate Christ, yeah? a Christophany in, uh, in uh, theological terms. And this revelation is in keeping with the visible manifestation of God's protection of His people throughout the course of redemptive history. Yeah, we see that in the Old Testament, many examples uh, of that, whether it is the, the, the cloud and the pillar, whether uh, it is the, this, the mysterious figure who appears before Joshua, identifying himself as the commander of God's armies on many occasions. Yeah, um, God... God's glory is manifested. God's protection is manifested. Second, the point really is that the Son of God is in the furnace with His people. I think that is profoundly symbolic. Because it means what is done to them, His people in the furnace, is done to Him as well. What they are experiencing in the furnace he is experiencing as well. This is because Jesus was fully human even as he was fully divine. So what he experiences, the trials, the temptations, the pain, the suffering, the uncertainty, the sadness, all this that his people experience, he has experienced as well. Yeah, Hebrews 4.15, he experienced it. And number three, Jesus delivers. Here, he delivers from the persecution of men, right? The fires that was the result of the persecution of men, the furnace itself. We know that later on, he delivers his people from the fire of the wrath of God. So what has Christ accomplished? we really can see something of the gospel in Daniel chapter 3. In the presence of the fourth man, we see the faithfulness of God to his promises. God promises to be with his people when they pass through the waters of affliction and the fires of persecution. As Isaiah says in chapter 43, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Try as they may, neither Satan nor Nebuchadnezzar can separate Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego from the love and presence of God. He is indeed with them even as he promises. And this promise is fulfilled through Christ. So what we see here is but a, a, a dim reflection, a vague foreshadowing of Christ's victory over the fires of hell. The flames of death and hell did not consume Jesus just as the flames do not consume the three men in, the, in Babylon's uh, furnace. Indeed, in this story, we see that death is swallowed up in victory in and because of Christ. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had every reason to expect a, 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 a fiery death, so to speak. Yeah? Yet the fire did not harm their bodies. So we, we may ask, as Paul did, yeah? where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? In Christ, death has already been swallowed up in victory. And how was it that Christ could triumph over death? through his perfect obedience to God in fulfillment of the Father's will. 
as reflected also in Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Not my will, but thine be done. Yeah, remember the, the, the perfect prayer of God's uh, anointed son. The picture of obedience, of sacrifice, of faith, of trust foreshadowed in Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and perfected in Christ. So as I close today, I want to close by focusing actually on Nebuchadnezzar's response, uh, which is interesting because uh, you might wonder why end uh, such a message by focusing on this, the response of this personification of idolatry. Yeah. Uh, in fact, not, not just personification of idolatry, he is an idol himself, he idolizes himself. So why focus on him? Because of his rather remarkable remarks in verse 28 and 29. Let me read for us. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. This is an astonishing, amazing statement. Why do I say so? You turn back to verse 15, Nebuchadnezzar asked again, huh? Who is that God that shall deliver you from my hands? Okay? This is a man who is very sure of himself. To him, that was a rhetorical question, right? Answer is obviously, no God is going to deliver you from my hands because I'm so great. Yeah? In fact, not only was it a rhetorical question, he was mocking God with that question. But now look what Nebuchadnezzar is declaring. Yeah? Number one. He recognizes the covenant God of Israel, the God of creation, the Most High. Number two, he recognizes that this God is a God who can send help for his people. Yeah? Uh, he sent an angel. Nebuchadnezzar recognized that. Number three, Nebuchadnezzar knows that the covenant God delivers his people. He admits that the covenant God delivered them from the fiery furnace. Number four, Nebuchadnezzar testifies to the means of this deliverance through the Son of God. He doesn't realize that he is testifying to Christ. Number five, he recognizes that God is worthy of trust, trust of his people. Number six, he articulated how believers are delivered through trust in God and his ways. Number seven, this God is worthy of trust total surrender. Why? Because he can change the king's word. Nebuchadnezzar admitted that this God can change the king's word. Number eight, Nebuchadnezzar knew that God demanded total and exclusive allegiance. And he went so far as to contribute, if you will, to ensuring that allegiance, right? Anyone who speaks ill of their God is going to be killed. Their house going to be destroyed. Eight revelations that he declares. Taken together, if you didn't know better, is something of a confession, right? It reads like a confessional statement. Nebuchadnezzar declares the victory of Christ's kingdom over the kingdom of the Antichrist. So who would ever have suspected that at a pagan festival on the plain of Dura would lead to such a conclusion. It's not going according to script. It didn't go according to script, right? It was supposed to end with everyone bowing and the spectacle of a fiery death of three insubordinates and the lesson learned by everyone. That was how it was supposed to end. But God showed that He is in control of everything. It was God's intent to glorify His name even on the plain of Dura that day. Now there's another lesson that we need to learn 
from this and, and I will end with this. The greatest miracle in this story is not the physical deliverance of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, as, as miraculous as that is. The greatest miracle is that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were preserved from the ways and the idolatry of Babylon. Remember when we, when we started uh, um, this, this series on, on Daniel, right? All the way back to Daniel 1. Nebuchadnezzar had this grand strategic plan to transform the entire outlook and worldview of a generation of young men of Judah, the best and the brightest of Judah, right? That was his plan, a very elaborate plan. Now, after 20 odd years, yes, he probably had some measure of success, but he failed in the case of these three young men. God made a mockery of men's ambitions and plans when he preserved, delivered these three young men and gave them the courage to defy a king. You see, God preserves his faithful from the influences of the world. He does this through the deliverance that the redemptive work of our Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished, the fourth man in the fire. Indeed, Christ went into and through the fire in our place. And because of that, He can and He shall deliver us. So brothers and sisters, we all face trials in our lives. Sometimes God saves us from our trials by providing relief, by providing healing. He pulls us out of the proverbial fiery furnace as he did Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Sometimes in his providence, God saves us by taking us from our trials, by taking us home. You think of our dear brother Jason and the trials that he, he was going through. Reminds me of the words of uh, Thomas Watson, who's a Puritan preacher. We spend our years with sighing. It is a valley of tears. But death is the funeral of all our sorrows. Regardless of the outcome, God never abandons His children. Yes, God allows the three friends to go through the struggle, the uncertainty, the doubt and the fear in the build-up, right? Why? Because when He has tested me, I will come forth as gold. That is our hope. And because Christ has won that final victory with His perfect obedience and faithfulness, that is our assurance. For those here who have yet to believe, this very assurance that God's children can lay claim to, you cannot. You cannot until you confess your sin and your total need for this assurance. Mind you, I mentioned about Nebuchadnezzar's realization even amounting to a, a confessional statement. But we stop short there. Why? Because Nebuchadnezzar's remarks in those last verses of chapter 3 showed that he knew a lot about God but there is no evidence that he knows God. It is the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. It is not my Nebuchadnezzar's God. So it's very different knowing about God and knowing God, knowing Jesus as your saviour and the source of your comfort and assurance. So may God give us eyes to see, ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to believe. Amen.